Aaron. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Shannon. Of course. Could you just introduce yourself really quick to everybody listening? Yes, I'm Aaron Thomas. I'm a family law attorney in Atlanta, Georgia, and the founder of prenups.com. I'm sure you are the life of every party. <laughs> I'm super fun at parties. No, <laughs> no best man speeches in my history. <laughs> <laughs> And and why I wanted to have you on today is not only, I mean, you have clear expertise in this area, which I want to get into, but also because I think that with most things in life, planning is a paramount step in anything you do, especially those things that are going to impact your life, like choosing a lifelong partner. But but I want to talk to you about how you became interested in family law, prenups in particular, and why you're so passionate about educating people on the topic. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to be a lawyer, you know, from from a young child, but family law was not my, you know, original aim. You know, kids don't typically say I want to be a divorce lawyer when I grow up. And but I got recruited into it. You know, the office that I ended up working with was looking for somebody with trial experience. I had it. I joined in. I didn't know, you know, really anyone. I'd, a lot of my friends hadn't even been married, much less divorce. Uh, my parents just celebrated 57 years together. So you know, I had no idea what divorce was like. I had this vague idea that, you know, you get married, if it doesn't work out, you kind of split things 50-50. Boy, you know, was that <laughs> pretty far from the truth. And, you know, my original advice to friends and family and anyone who would listen was don't get married. It's it's this legal contract that you have no idea what you're getting into. Um, because I saw what happens on the back end when things don't work out and you know, trust me, you don't want to be involved in a messy divorce. You know, nobody does. I don't think that's a controversial statement. And over the years, my my views softened. I met the woman that I wanted to spend, you know, the rest of my life with and get married. Um, and I really was thinking, how can I do this and not end up in the same position as one of my clients? And basically, I tried to take all the lessons that I learned from my you know, divorcing clients, divorcing couples over the years and say, if I were to reverse engineer a successful marriage, what would it look like? And a big part of that is getting a prenup and deciding on certain things ahead of time so they don't become arguments down the line. Yeah. And I, there's this this kind of approach to it where they say, oh, if you have a prenup, you're setting yourself up for failure or that you're anticipating failure or planning for the worst case scenario which if I say planning for the worst case scenario, that could be taken positively or negatively, right? Are you setting yourself up? Are you speaking it into existence that you're planning on getting divorced? Is that what a prenup means? What's your take on that? Yeah, I think that, you know, just like you kind of hinted at, planning for the future is a good thing. It is a positive thing. And, you know, it's not planning for divorce. You know, I mean, a prenup done correctly is like a partnership agreement. You know, it's just like if you were if you had a business and you have a partnership agreement, any partnership agreement that is halfway decent is going to have some terms in there that plan for what happens if we have to dissolve this partnership. But that's not the goal of the agreement. That's not the aim of the partnership agreement. It is a it is a feature, you know, in terms of, you know, does it does it jinx you? You know, does it are you kind of planning? Is it setting you up for divorce? The way I look at it is this. Very few houses are going to burn down, but most people are going to get fire insurance for it. And when you get insurance on your house, it doesn't say, oh, I'm going to act recklessly. No, you're going to get insurance and you're going to do everything in your power to keep your house from burning down. You know, the same way you get car insurance, you don't start driving recklessly. You get life insurance. You don't start take up skydiving. You know, you can you can do both things. You can protect yourself against the worst case scenario and try to avoid that worst case scenario at the same time. Yeah, it's like the elbow pads and knee pads, <laughs> like just in case. No, I love that approach to it because I think it, it can go both ways. There's definitely, there's no wrong opinion or wrong perspective on it. I just think that there's the open-mindedness to understand like what the intention is. And I think the intention of an agreement like that is really based on what the who the partners are that are signing it. That's like their intention of the agreement of this is how we're going to create a successful marriage. And as long as both partners have that approach in going into it, then that's what it is. Let's talk about the ways that, I guess, some other myths that exist around prenuptial agreements, divorce, whatever it may be, that you've heard and maybe that you've overcome yourself by getting into this profession. Yeah, yeah. You know, a a big one is, and maybe the biggest one is you got to be rich. You know, that prenups mm. are something that, 
most of the time when we hear about him, we hear about him from celebrities, you know, rich people or, you know, the 80, 80 year old oil tycoon and his, you know, 28 year old girlfriend. And so a lot of people look at a prenup and say, well, that's not for me. You know, like we barely got anything, you know, coming into the marriage. And my response to that is, you know, if if we accept the idea that one of the major aims of a prenup is avoiding a messy, expensive, drawn out divorce. What causes a messy, expensive, drawn out divorce is not what you have coming into the marriage. It's what you accumulate during the marriage. That is what is the source of a lot of the litigation and why billions of dollars go from the pockets of divorcing couples into the pockets of divorce lawyers every year. And I say that as you know, someone who practices divorce law for you know many, many years myself. The truth is, you know, it is not uncommon for people to spend, you know, 25% of their net worth fighting over who gets the other 75% in the case of a divorce. And you do not need to be ridiculously wealthy to benefit from it. I mean, if you are, if you've gotten multi-millions, then you can afford to pay your lawyers no matter how long the divorce case takes. If you've got less than 50 grand, okay, you know, then maybe, you know, getting a prenup is not going to make sense for you. You know, there's just, you know, there's not going to be that much if you've got 50 grand at the time that your marriage potentially comes to an end. But if you're anywhere in between that, the cost of the attorney's fees and the length of that case is going to be a major factor in your life, you know, financially, as well as, you know, the average contested divorce case takes 12 to 18 months of your life. A lot of my clients described it like having a second full-time job because that's how all-consuming it is. So I could see that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the avoidance of, you know, the divorce case itself and the expenses that go along with that is actually more of a concern to the middle class than it is to the super wealthy. I agree. I could definitely see that happening. I mean, as someone who's built a house with their spouse, someone who has gone through a closing, a refinancing, a, you know, all those things, all those transactions that also involve lawyers, you know, the, you know, business transactions and so on. It's absolutely, I could see that happening where it becomes the second job that you're basically going through. It's the major thing. It's like your uh, forced hobby (laughs) that you're doing on the side and not making any money from, in fact, the opposite. So no, that's a really good perspective on it. Are there any other myths other than, I mean, we've, we've covered that it's for the, you know, the wealthy or that it is setting you up for failure. What are some of the other, I guess, arguments against getting a prenup that you've heard that you could kind of walk us through? Yeah. Some people will take the position that, you know, we don't need a prenup, you know, we'll just do a 50, 50 split or we'll be reasonable. You know, I don't think that my spouse would ever do that to me. They're not that type of person. And that one is troubling to me for so many reasons. I mean, nobody, let's be real, nobody goes into their marriage thinking they're going to get divorced. Everyone thinks that this is the person that they're going to spend um, the rest of their lives with. But the system is not set up for an easy 50-50 split if things come to an end. You know, number one, you've got to agree on what exists. And that is easier said than done. You know, unless you have like absolute radical transparency for all of the finances in your marriage, If you go through a divorce, any lawyer worth their salt is going to tell you, you get one shot to do this right. Let's go out, go ahead and send out the subpoenas. Let's go ahead and send out the document requests. You know, let's get five years of bank statements, every credit card statement, every, you know, it's an uh, audit account that exists. Yeah, it's an audit account. It is a full on audit of your finances. If you own a business, we're going to take a look at that. And, you know, once that happens, you know, if, if somebody gets all of those discovery requests coming their direction, They're going to do the same thing to the other side. And you're already 10, 15, 20 grand into attorney's costs before you've even established, you know, what's out there. And then the other aspect of it is even if people are trying to be fair, there is something that I've noticed, a a dynamic that I've noticed in couples where if each spouse feels like they're doing 50% of the labor or the work in the relationship, each spouse thinks they're doing 70%. That is just, that's just how it happens. It happens in happy relationships too, right? Oh, we totally, all always, totally. We can see the work that we're doing. Whatever my wife is doing is completely invisible to me. So like, yeah. I'm very aware of me dropping, you know, the kid off at school and doing the dishes, you know, and making the bed. And I don't see that she's cleaned the bathroom and got the mail and taking the trash out or what have you. And well, we're so- not keeping score. 
and right. and we're using different score cards even like we're not we're playing different games trying to like <laughs> keep our own score right exactly exactly and so you know when it comes time for you know people go through a divorce case and they hear from their lawyer that the court can take into account you know who play what roles and who did what two people can very you know like honestly believe that they deserve the lion's share of the assets in a divorce and and they're not lying you know they they could they would pass a lie detector test you know if you ask them and and that kind of disparity in terms of their perception ends up you know ends up in litigation so and then each person has their own lawyer and you know I know to lawyer myself I'm not trying to drive up litigation but you know, if I'm just hearing the story of the person that I'm talking to, of course, I'm going to take their side. And it's very easy for lawyers to be like, you know, yeah, of course you deserve, you know, everything that you're asking for and more. And if the other side doesn't agree, then all of a sudden, you know, you're in 12, 18 months of litigation and tens of thousands of dollars, you know, in attorney's costs. Yeah. And and so what I'm hearing is that it's really about, you know, you have these two different independent perceptions coming to the table. And it's very, very seldom that both of them add up to a hundred percent or both of them add up to the perfect, you know, oh, that makes sense. You know, like that they're coming to the table with the same perception of what's going on. And it's, it's so true. Even in happy relationships, like my husband and I, Lord knows we could go back and forth. If we really wanted to have a fight about who does what and like what it's worth, you could go back all day, every day and know him, whatever, you know, it's a different currency that you're measuring in. It's different time. It's different energy you're on a totally different wavelength. So I totally understand about that. And I could see that happening in a heartbeat, even when you have the most amicable emotions coming into a divorce, right? It's like, it's just right. pure, pure perception of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, the trust has fallen apart by the time a relationship ends. It's exactly because some people say, well, a prenup makes it gives you an easy way out or makes it easy to get divorced. And the truth is, you know, couples don't break up until they are really at the point of no return. When you're in your dating life, if a relationship is on a scale of one to 10, you may break up when the relationship hits a five, you know, you're, or four, you're no longer, you know, you're no longer feeling it anymore. People who are married, even when they have prenups, they take that relationship so seriously, they don't typically end the relationship until they're at a one or a two. And at that point, you know, the trust is so far gone on. And a lot of people, you know, use the phrase of, I don't even know who they are anymore, you know, and the person that you marry is not the person that you divorce. And so what I have found is even when people are trying to be fair, even when people come to me and they say, I just want my fair share, I just want to split everything exactly in half. Can we just send a settlement offer that says we're going to split everything in half? I want to be 100 percent totally fair and open. And we send that settlement offer over to the other side. And what happens is somebody trying to be extremely fair and open looks suspiciously like somebody is trying to hide something like this is too easy they're offering me you know like an exact 50 percent division of the assets there must be something that i don't know about there must be an mm. account i don't know about and so some of the clients who come to me and they in their good faith just want to get out they want to make it quick they want to make it fast they want to make it easy and it ends up backfiring on them and and the response is a bunch of subpoenas for additional documents so you can have the best of intentions it doesn't mean that your spouse has to be evil it doesn't mean that your lawyer has to be evil you can just end up in a system that is not geared towards an easy division you know an easy end to your marriage if you don't have an agreement in place on what happens yeah and speaking of that i want to talk through ways to prevent this from happening or ways to avoid the need for a prenup, right? Because I'm sure in your work, you've seen couples come to you who are you know, in the position to divorce or are in the position to do a prenup. And I want to know what, especially from what you've seen in your work, what types of things can contribute to getting to that place and how somebody could actually just avoid it altogether, avoid the whole necessary agreement, well, not necessarily the agreement, but avoid having to actually implement it. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I I exactly what you're saying. There's two ways to avoid a messy divorce, right? One is to have a freedom that prevents the divorce from being messy. And the other is not to get divorced at all, right? So if that's our number one aim, you know, what I have found is that, um, interestingly, the, the same principles that make for a good prenup make for a good marriage, make for a good marriage itself. So number one is transparency. For every prenup to be enforceable, each spouse has to disclose all of their assets and debts to each other on the front end. 
whether or not you get a prenup. This is something that couples should do at the beginning of their marriage, literally, and not just talk it out, but literally put down on paper a net worth statement for each spouse. What are we each bringing in? What are our assets? What are our debts? And then take it a step further than that and really talk about what your financial habits are. You know, do you carry balances on your credit cards? You know, are you like an aggressive saver? Are you just putting enough in your 401k to get the match and talk about those behaviors? And it's, you know, it's the kinds of things that that you talk about on your podcast for your listeners, I think is so brilliant because you really have to go to the psychology behind, you know, kind of your money habits and your money decisions. It's not enough to just put the X's and O's. Having those conversations with your spouse about their attitudes towards money, what their goals are, you know, how they view it. Is it something dirty? Is it a necessary evil? You know, is it something they fully accepted? And having those conversations so you can get on the front page, you know, you can get on the right page at the at the front end of your marriage. You know, getting married is probably the most important financial decision that you'll make in your life. A lot of people don't look at it as a financial decision. Certainly it's not purely a financial decision, but it has one of the biggest impacts of of, of any financial decision you possibly make in your life. So transparency on the front end is, you know, a very big first step. I couldn't agree more. And I always looked at now, my husband and I are both business owners. And when we were getting married, I wasn't a business owner, but he was, he's been a business owner since he was 22. We, but we come from business worlds and we are quote unquote weird. I know that you listening haven't done this or maybe haven't done this, but we approached, we both approached our marriage and it's probably why we're married, but we both approached our marriage as a business merger. So we said, okay, like we have to come to the table, figure out what is combining. And well, each of us had net worths already. We were in our late twenties, early thirties. So it was, you know, after you've been through and lived your life a little bit, you have something at stake. And I say, I'm pouring in my 20s, the wealth I've accumulated in my 20s, my retirement savings, all of these things. And in some cases, we're going to be putting stuff in both our names before I like allow your name on my stuff. I got to be sure we're we're good and like we're protected if something happens. And not only that, I think when you look at it as we are protected and not I am protected and you look out for each other when you're in a good place and say like, I think I, I literally said this in a prior conversation with you, but we were talking about how to avoid divorce. And one of the ways I, I joke around with my bu- my business partners too, I say, I want you to sit down when you love each other and come up with every hilarious way you could screw one another. Mm-hmm. And and when it's actually hyperbolic and, hyper- and hypothetical, when it's like, hey, that'd be funny. Like, how could this movie end badly in our imagination? And when we know it's not even a possibility right now, we can't even fathom doing this to each other right now because we love each other. And in a funny way, that's not manifesting into an existence, guys. It's it's kind of like de-escalating the issue and saying, these are all like the, this is where my brain can go and how I can possibly screw you over and like, tell me where your brain's going to go. And let's just make sure we build the safeguards now that that will never happen because we love each other right now. That is a big thing for me is actually imagining the worst case scenario together, like pour a cup of coffee, sit down and go through every term of the quote unquote contract of what could go wrong and let's cover our bases here. And we actually find that somewhat romantic. We find that to be a statement of our love for each other, which I know sounds counterintuitive. What are your thoughts on that? I think, I think it is absolutely brilliant. And your you know, your description of the joining of your financial lives as a business merger is such a perfect one. And it's one that I come back to all the time. I mean, particularly you mentioned that you're in your late twenties, early thirties, our parents' generation, you know, people back then got married average age, like 2021. Mm-hmm. And so they really were blank slates coming together. You know, if they were a business, it'd be like a startup, two people coming together, whipping up something in the garage. And the average people get who person who gets married today, they're age 29, 30. And they're coming in with four or five bank accounts, three, four credit cards, retirement account, you know, maybe a piece of real property, maybe a small business like your husband had. Yep. And yep. it is truly like a corporate merger. And no one would ever do that. No one in the right mind would ever do that without sitting down and coming up with the terms of what is our what is our plan for this? How do we join our finances? How do we join our, our businesses? You know, how do we merge in a way that doesn't create arguments? 
to make sure that we're both clear on where we stand, what are each of our rights, what are each of our responsibilities going in. And yes, absolutely. If the worst comes to worst, what do we agree is fair on the front end? And a second point, piggybacking off what you said, communication is that second point. So transparency is the first. Communication is that second one. And, you know, putting in place, you know, I actually, I call it the shareholders uh, meeting. I ask couples to to think about doing it at least on an annual basis, sometimes quarterly, where they have a shareholders meeting and they have an agenda. These are the things we're going to talk about. My wife and I, we have it a repeating event on our calendar every December 1st. We do. We're going to sit down. We're going to talk quarterly. about Quarterly. We do yeah, the quarterlies. Yeah. We do the quarterly net worth. Did we go up? Did we go down? Is all the money where it's supposed to be and fulfilling the purpose that we planned for it? So like we're all making decisions together. Yeah. 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 Perfect. And it takes some of the sting out of it. You talked about how could we how could we possibly screw each other? You know, when you're talking about it as a hypothetical, it is so much of an easier conversation than if you wait until it's punitive. So, for example, you know, one of the things that people will put in their prenups is anything that is spent that is over, say, five hundred dollars from a joint account has to be discussed before that expenditure takes place. And when couples hear that on the front end, they're always like, oh yeah, for some couples, it may be $200. For some couples, maybe $20,000, depending on your financial situation. But every couple can come up with an amount of money that if it's going to be spent from the joint account, they would like for there to be a conversation first. And it's so much easier to agree on that on the front end, rather than when that conversation is happening after somebody spent an amount that you don't agree with, then it feels like a punitive rule. Nobody has a problem with that when you do it in this hypothetical, but when you do it because, you know, somebody went out and bought an iPhone from the joint account and, you know, some the other spouse wasn't expecting it, then all of a sudden it feels punitive. Have that kind of communication, you know, those kinds of rules, the quarterly meeting, like you said, have those things set up on the front end. And you can put those kinds of guidelines, those guardrails in a prenuptial agreement. You know, it's, it's not just about what happens when you divorce. You should be thinking about those things on the front end of your marriage. Totally. But speaking of the bank accounts, do you have a position or an opinion on joint versus separate checking accounts? This is something that I think very a lot of people disagree on or have different opinions on. And I've seen all this different advice out there over whether to keep your finances together or separated. What have you seen? Yeah, I use a, a concept that I call the money buckets. So there is mine, there is yours, and there is ours. And there's a couple of different ways that I've seen people set up their bank accounts that works. One is inside out, which is all of the income in the household goes into a joint account and each spouse gets an allowance, if you will, from that joint account that goes into their separate account. Some agreed upon amount or agreed upon percentage of you know the leftover income. Other couples will go outside in. So the money goes into their separate accounts and then they contribute to a joint account, usually pro rata with their income or some other agreed upon method to contribute to a joint account. But you have these three buckets because the truth is you're going to have, you know, I think with one, it's healthy for each spouse to have their own money. You know, my wife doesn't know how, doesn't need to know how often I go to Chick-fil-A. Right? And I think that it's important, you know, how much you're spending, not what you're spending it on. So, you know, if I go to Chick-fil-A, you know, a hundred times a year and my wife buys a new iPhone, but they both end up being the same amount of money. Why should we be fighting each other over those expenditures if the end result is the same? I think for some couples where their their inclination is to try to keep everything separate, it is more palatable for them to use the outside in method that feels like they have a little bit more autonomy that way. For couples that are, you know, their their natural inclination would just be to throw everything in a joint account. The inside out method works well. But I think having a clear separation and then it's easy, I think, to have conversations about, is this a joint expense, something we're going to pay from the joint account, or is this something that we're going to pay from the separate account? One thing that I can say does not work is you can't go Dutch for life. You know, keeping everything 100% separate, your spouse is not the same as your roommate. And there's got to be some accounting for the fact that, you know, you're going to play different roles over the course of your relationship. And I think what happens in a lot of those instances is the person who is raising children or, you know, sacrifices for the other person's career ends up getting the short end of the stick. And, you know, that's why I think pro rata contributions to a joint account, if you choose to have your income go into separate accounts, is going to make for, you know, less arguments than 
just keeping everything separate or throwing everything all in one account. I agree. And and for those of you who may not be familiar with the term, pro rata just means proportionately, right? Like it, it, in accordance with how much you're actually making, you're putting in a certain percentage. We did that. We actually weren't planning. Like we didn't plan, oh, we're going to take the outside in or inside out approach. Like we didn't sit down and contemplate it. We kind of just looked at each other and said, this feels right. We each came to the table with our own set of checking accounts and savings accounts that let's just get a joint account and agree how much we're going to put into the house fund, if you will. And that's going to be the money that we save as a couple for our future together. But we came to the table with money that was coming in. And quite frankly, we were just kind of too lazy to change the direct deposit info on our jobs and on our businesses to be like, well, it's just still going to pour into the accounts it's been pouring into. And we're just going to make this other thing. And it was operationally, it, it made sense. But now that I think about it, consciously, if I had to go back, I would do the exact same thing because it's a really great system where we have this kind of this money from a joint account that we both pour into. We both have pride over. We both share and have created this together. And I think also having something that you've created together in terms of wealth that is mixed and commingled is kind of a good feeling because it's also, hey, we both created this. It's almost like a group project together that we've done. And we get to decide what to do with it together, like buy a new home or finish up something that we both benefit from. So I think that's a great approach to it. I would totally agree with you. Yeah. And something like that, I think it's perfect the way you guys did it. And something like that combined with, you know, the quarterly meeting gives you the opportunity to course correct. I think, you know, one of the things that that people run into is not having, when you don't have that specific time to sit down and be able to possibly course correct, people end up in horrible situations. You know, a prime example, I had a couple where the husband, when they got married, the husband made, you know, say 75 grand and the wife was in school. And so the, they didn't do a joint account. You know, they didn't set anything up like that. And the husband was just like, okay, I'll pay the mortgage and the utilities while you're in school. Well, over the course of the marriage, the wife graduated from school, ended up getting a good job. And 10 years later, she was making twice what the husband made. But the way they had things set up, the husband was still paying the mortgage and all of the utilities with no contribution from his wife. And, you know, when you ask, you know, how did this happen? They said, well, we didn't have, we just never talked about it. It just, you know, the momentum, the inertia just drove us down this path. By default. Anyone, right, by default. And anyone looking at this situation would be like, She's making twice as much as you and she's not contributing to the household expenses at all. Like, how do you even get in that situation? And it's a combination of factors. It's by default. It's you've got inertia. It's you don't have these things. You don't have a specific time to sit down and revisit these types of issues in your household. But also money is difficult to talk about. You know, it's so taboo. It's shame. People don't talk to their friends about how are you? How are you and your wife? You know, treating the you know your finances in your household, and right. how much are they contributing to the utilities? And people just end up going down these paths without any help. And that is, you know, one of the reasons why I try to help people through prenups structure their finances. And we put in these kinds of rules in the agreements itself. You're going to sit down every six months, every twelve months. You're going to talk about these things. You're going to revisit your contributions to the joint account anytime somebody loses a job, gains a job. You move to a new house. You know, you have time to talk about or you talked about, are we going to put this money that we're contributing to the joint account? Are we going to buy a new house? Uh, my wife and I, our big thing is having a travel fund. So we decided we're going to set aside, you know, 5% of all the income that comes in the household into a travel fund. And that's a way that, you know, the money conversation doesn't have to be all doom and gloom and like, you know, you need to cut back on your spending. It can be fun. Like you said, it can be, you know, taking pride in this thing that you've built together and attaching that money to the plan that you have, the shared plan that you and your spouse have for your lives. So, and I did want to get in kind of the third point, kind of the third prong of how people, you know, should set up their finances. We talked about transparency. We talked about communication. Yep. And the last one is fairness. That's where it comes in to, you know, having a time to revisit and making sure, is this still working for you? Maybe in year one of the marriage, certain contributions to the joint account make sense. And then over time, you know, lots of things happen. You may move, you may change jobs, you may have children. Having a time to come back and say, does this work for you? And then yes, fairness also plays into this worst case scenario. If we don't work out, can we agree now what would be fair before we get to that point where the lawyers are involved or the trust has broken down or the communication is non-existent. Can we agree on the front end? And I find that couples are so have such an easier time agreeing on what would be fair if the relationship didn't work out 
at the beginning of their marriage, when they're in love, when things are at their highest, rather than waiting until the communication and trust has completely dissolved. And, and that's how people end up, you know, giving a significant percentage of their net worth to divorce attorneys. I think, you know, thinking about fairness on the front end is not just going to avoid having a messy divorce down the line, but can actually prevent the divorce because you are putting that principle at the forefront of your relationship on the front end. I agree. And, you know, fairness is a function of context, right? So fairness is always subjective. There, There is no definition of fairness when it comes down to it. So you have to really agree on what that means and come to an agreement. But also, I, I love that you you focus on that because fairness is something that, again, it's so subjective. It's so, you know, it's so different to each person that you have to come to the table and be able to talk about it. And I, and like you said, Aaron, the money topic is not easy to talk about. And I know that like Jason and I, we both come from this like neutral place of money and come from business backgrounds and we're willing to talk about money. We actually enjoy it. You know, like pour a coffee and say, Hey, Shan, what's on the balance sheet this month or whatever. And it's cool. But I think that until you can make that a habit, that is what you have to focus on is making a habit of talking about these things during the marriage at the beginning, for sure, like you just said, but you have to keep the habit going, which will also neutralize how you talk about it and make it a less stressful thing. If it does go sideways, I feel like then you can kind of game plan and put out the fire together. Let's say something bad happens with your money. You lose a bunch of money through an investment you both made or God forbid someone takes it from you. I feel like when those things happen and those challenges come across your desk, it's like, okay, well, we've talked about this. We know like we have the plan. We have the stop, drop and roll, right? We have the emergency exit plans. We have all this stuff kind of in place and it doesn't seem sexy to talk about, but God, like how, how we can walk around now securely and confidently knowing even if something bad happens and even if something happens to us that we didn't like, we didn't trigger we know we're going to be okay. Or we know that we both are on the same page with the approach. And I think that's everything is the peace of mind. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think you're exactly right. And, and it really does all stem from that, that central piece, the, the communication and making the ongoing communication, the habit in your marriage, you know, the, the most disastrous heartbreaking situations that I've seen in the thousand plus divorces that I've participated in, in one way or another always come from some kind of breakdown in communication. You know, an, another quick example for your listeners is, you know, I, I had a couple where, you know, the husband was uh, as part of his, as part of his occupation. And for 30 years of the marriage, he had met, he had managed, you know, the household finances and the wife had just trusted him to handle all of that stuff. And then at near the end of the marriage, she started criticizing her spending and started really coming down on, you know, what she was doing with her money. And she didn't understand it. She thought that it always been fine. And come to find out, he had basically taken their entire nest egg and gambled it away on penny stocks. Wow. It would, it would, you know, this one penny stock he he got obsessed with, it would go up in value and he'd pour a bunch of money in thinking that he was riding the wave up and then it would tank and he would sell it all, you know, <laughs> trying to get out while yeah. he still had some money left. And he did this for years and years until their entire nest egg was down to zero. And you know, at the end of that, he felt resentful because he felt like all of the burden was on him to manage the finances. He didn't even see his fault in what he'd done. And obviously, you know, the wife felt betrayed because she had trusted him and he was making these humongous moves that were going to impact them for the rest of their lives without any kind of communication. And that is exactly the type of thing that just cannot happen if you have a quarterly meeting where, you know, <laughs> where the net worth right. statement is slapped down on the table and you see these things happening in process. And then if something bad happens, just like you said, you can own it together. You can sit down. You're on the same team. You can come up with a plan to address it. And it's not me versus you. And like, what did you do with our money? It's like, what are we going to do about this? You know, it's team us versus everybody at that point. And that's just a much better place to be in. in I agree. Relationship. Be on the same team, guys. You're on the same team. And it's funny because this is an episode where we started about prenups and we're talking about you have to be on the same team. That is fundamentally what we're trying to get across is that get on the same team, guys. Aaron, thank you so much for your time today. Can you just tell us where we can find out more about you and what you're doing? And if anyone wants to reach out to you for more questions or assistance? 
Yes, absolutely. You can find more information about me, the services that we offer at prenups.com. You can also follow me at, at prenup guy on Instagram, pretty much every other social media platform. And you have an amazing checklist too, don't you? Yes, we've got a premarital checklist. It is a free download at prenups.com. Come check us out. A lot of great information to help you, whether you're at the beginning of your marriage or 20 years in. So I hope it'll be of, of good use to your listeners. I'm sure it will. Aaron, thank you so much for joining us today and shedding some light on this topic. Really, really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for having me.